welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. Today we're delighted to welcome back uh, for another presentation Grant Newsham, who is a senior fellow with the Center for Security Policy. He is also a research fellow at the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies, focusing on Asia-Pacific defense, political, and economic matters. He is a retired U.S. Marine Colonel and was the first U.S. Marine liaison officer to the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force and was the U.S. Marine attache to the American Embassy in Tokyo twice. Grant Newsham has more than 20 years of experience in Japan and elsewhere in Asia, so he's well qualified to address our subject today the legacy of Shinzo Abe and the future of the Indo-Pacific. Welcome back, Grant. Well, thanks very much, Paul. Glad to be here. Good to have you on this side of the Great Pond, <laughs> as you are resident in Asia. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's kind of like really hot here, even by Asian standards. So I'm looking forward to getting back to where it's just oh, nice. Oh, I see. Yeah. Cool off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. There was a statement by Mr. Taniguchi Abe's long-serving foreign policy advisor and speechwriter, mm -hmm. in a recent interview when he said Abe understood that Tokyo needed to do three things. Enhance its, its economy, reinvest in the alliance with the United States, and expand its diplomatic ties by reaching out to Australia and India. So how do you score the card on those three objectives over the long tenure of his prime ministership, the longest serving one in Japanese history, if I'm right. Well, I would give him uh, really an A on two of the three. On the third one, I'd give him a pass. Um, the, and the, the third one is the economy. Uh, and just I'll touch on that briefly, is that uh, the Japanese economy has been kind of in the doldrums, or not moving really very fast, very far. Uh, for the last 25 years, uh, just about, maybe 20 if you're charitable. And Abe, Mr. Abe's biggest mistake actually was listening, well, well he was listening to uh, the Ministry of Finance, listening to the Bank of Japan experts, and then not doing the exact opposite. <laughs> um, and I'm not really being funny, but, no, but these, true. well, I am being funny, but it's true actually. If he had just done the opposite of what they said, he'd have probably had some success and the basic problem with Japan is the, the taxes are too high, salaries are too low. And the Ministry of Finance, Bank of Japan, they are very, they're um, really sort of choked off uh, sort of the, the money flow to the average person. And if you heard what Japanese salaries are, you would just be astonished at how low they are. And it's really about that simple. So they talk about, well, inflation isn't high enough. Um, nobody's spending. Well, of course they're not spending when you have a tax system that absolutely fleeces them. And when you have companies which are not raising salaries. So it, the point, but the long, that's a long way of saying, I would give Mr. Abe a break on the economy. It's still, you know, it, for a lot of company, countries would like to have Japan's problems when it comes to an economy. So for all its problems, it's still, not bad. But where he really was successful, and that's where Mr. Taniguchi is, I think he really is correct, is that Prime Minister Abe recognized the importance of the U.S.-Japan relationship. And he knew that without the Americans, Japan really is in difficult straits in the region. Uh, China is out for blood. Uh, China wants to really pay back the Japanese. Uh, humiliate them. They want to dominate them. And China wants to drive the Americans out of the region too. And Abe knew this. And he was actually saying this in so many words long before it was considered proper in American political circles, like over a decade earlier. And he understood that and he did what was necessary to keep the American relation, the relationship with the Americans uh, solid or strong enough. Uh, and that took some doing on uh, Mr. Abe's part, um, partly because um, Abe has his, he sees World War II as differently than we would, most of us. And he sees that Japan was not 
really in the wrong all that much. He sees Japan as having been forced into uh, doing what it did uh, in the 30s and the 40s. And we would see it differently, of course. But Abe was, he was that rare thing, which is a statesman. And he was smart enough, you know, to, in simple terms, to keep quiet on those issues because he realized the bigger point, the bigger thing that Japan needed was not to argue over what happened 70, 80 years ago and, and have one side admit, well, yeah, you're right, I'm wrong, but rather to look at the, the present and look at the problems facing Japan, the risks, the, the external risks facing Japan, particularly from China, but there's also North Korea and Russia in there. Uh, but from China in particular, and he, he knew that without the American alliance, without the U.S. presence, that Japan's prospects are not very good. Well, I think it was early in his second and longest tenure as prime minister, he said, Japan is back. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was a remark, certainly partly addressed to the United States. Oh, and it's, you know, it's a little, obviously, it's a little bit of the sort of, um, sort of public relations, but it's also true in a way. And if you look back and you remember how Japan, you know, just thinking from, say, the, the early 90s when I first went there, that the Japanese almost had no uh, image in the region. Yeah, they did a lot of business there. There were Japanese companies around and they gave a lot of foreign aid, but Japan was pretty much invisible and you never really heard much about it. Uh, and it, you know, for all that it did in the region, it was always amazing how little credit it got for this. And those that, things being for which they should have gotten you, credit? You would certainly think so. You know, but you, what, what are they? Well, the, I would say particularly the, the economic and uh, financial investments throughout the region. And you go to Thailand, for example, and you see you know, factories with Canon and Toyota and all the big Japanese companies. And the Japanese investment throughout the region, including in China, was immense. And you almost, it was almost part of the woodwork. People didn't notice that. But it represented an effort by the Japanese to get out and about in the region and to not just make some money for Japanese companies, but to help these other economies build themselves up. Uh, and say so they never say so explained themselves very well, and then it, it would end. Then after the bubble collapsed in the uh, late '80s, early '90s, and the Japanese economy just went flat at best, and that that seemed like Japan was finished. You know that it was just going to fade away. That the the threat, the fears of the '80s. Remember when the idea was Japan was going to take over? We'd all be working for the Japanese. Um, that those were unfounded, of course. But the, the idea was that it's just gone, that it had its chance, it's gone. And yet he was able to re, re, resurrect Japan's self-image and also, as I say, start speaking up on Japan's behalf. And so when, for example, Mr. Abe would go, say, to, uh, say, to the United States or even in Japan or elsewhere in the region and give a speech, you know, talking about his vision, of, of Asia with you know, Japan and other free nations getting together to protect and defend what he referred to as the free and open Indo-Pacific. He, he originated that phrase, did he not? He deserves credit for it. Yeah, um, you know, it's, yeah he, he did. And what it means is you know, free and open Indo-Pacific is um, what it says, that you know, it is a place where big countries don't suffocate little countries and strangle them. And he's talking about China, of course. And he's the one who started that idea. He also thought of the so-called quad. But if I say just still including his characterization of what the Indo-Pacific should represent or does represent, rule of law, free commerce, open sea lanes, uh, and human rights, uh, all of which are not favorably uh, looked upon by China. Oh, well, they, uh, they don't exist or they don't exist in a form we would recognize. Uh, China is the antithesis uh, of all of those ideas. And in fact, it's ironic that today's um, China is pretty much the Japan of the 1930s, where the Japanese in the 30s saw it as their right and their destiny to dominate, control all of Asia. Uh, and that the idea was, well, under Japanese leadership, Asia would thrive and the foreigners would be driven out. And now it's the Chinese who are trying to recreate the greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, which is what the Japanese called yes. uh, their effort. And 
it's, it is as ironic that it is now Japan, which is the much higher manifestation of human rights, liberty, law, um, and really fair dealing between nations. And I would just point out, if you don't believe me, well, when was the last time China had an election? Um, or you know, go to China and try to have a contract enforced. Um, a, for, for a contract means nothing more than Xi Jinping, the, the dictator of China, says it is. And China and Japan today is just the opposite of all of that. Now, uh, you mentioned that Abe had a different view of World War II. And of course, he, he comes from a very distinguished family and his grandfather was also a prime minister back in that era. On the other hand, his speeches on the open and free Indo-Pacific were very eloquent. He spoke about that here and throughout Asia. Was that enough to alleviate the bitterness from the legacy of Japan's behavior in World War II? I remember when I was in China as a guest of the Central Committee Foreign Department of the Communist Party, one of the first things they did was take our little delegation to a memorial dedicated to Japan's atrocities against the Chinese in Shanghai and elsewhere. So they don't, obviously, the Chinese don't forget or don't want to forget or, but Korea, Taiwan, there, there were, I mean, Indochina, there are other places uh, that, that also have that legacy. Have, has that pretty much been dealt with by the country Japan has become since 1946? I think it has. Um, and I grew up with stories of the River Kwai camps. Um, so I am, um, and I actually used to teach the law, law of war for the Marines. And I would use the Japanese, Imperial Japanese Army's behavior in World War II as case studies of depravity and what not to do. Uh, so it's ironic that I lived in Japan for 25 years and helped the J Japanese start their Marine Corps. Um, but countries change. And Japan is a very different place. And the I would suggest that even 20 years ago that most of the, the bitterness uh, towards Japan over its behavior in World War II is gone. And you, you never hear that. And you, but when you go down, the, go down the country list and you will find <coughs> the Chinese who are, you know, who um, do have the resentment and their government stokes that as it suits their purposes. Korea, the same thing. There is plenty of ill will towards the Japanese. Uh, if you think about the Irish and the English, you're kind of in the, that sort of the Koreans and the Japanese. Um, but go down the rest of the rest of the, the area, the Philippines, the Japanese are very well liked. Uh, Taiwan, extremely well liked. Um, Indonesia, the Indonesians see the Japanese as having helped drive out the Dutch. Uh, Vietnam, mm -hmm. same thing. The Japanese get credit uh, for having helped end colonialism, though it took a couple more wars from the Vietnamese perspective. Um, India, they very, very supportive of Japan, and there's uh, no ill will towards Japan, quite the opposite. Uh, and Malaysia as well. It was the, the Chinese who suffered uh, the most during the Japanese occupation. The Malays kind of, well, but not so bad. Singaporeans, they have been wise enough to, well, they've been whatever, um, for whatever reason, have decided to let bygones be bygones. And the Australians as well. And they have a pretty good relationship with the Japanese. So it's if you when you keep score, that yes, the Chinese and the Koreans, that there, there's some memories of World War II, and it's not to dismiss it. But the rest of Asia, they realize that, well, this is a different Japan. And that is something that uh, I wish the Japanese could speak up and explain themselves better on that regard. And I, they, they're not very good at explaining themselves. Um, in fact, a famous uh, New York Times reporter told me not that long ago, that of all the peoples he had ever met anywhere, the Japanese were the worst at explaining themselves. And they've got a good story to tell, and it's sometimes you'd like be nice if the Americans would help them tell it. But the, so as I said, that issue of World War II, it's, uh, I don't think it's much of an issue, except when China tries to raise it, and it's there with the Korea-Japan relationship. And I would point out that after 1945, the Chinese Communist Party has killed at least 50 million of its own people in peacetime and good weather. 
And this is something the Imperial Japanese Army could not have dreamed of doing. And yet the Chinese Communist Party has done it. So it, it offers some context for this argument that you hear a lot as to, um, that you hear all the time, well, you know, Asians are, they don't like Japan because of World War II. Well, as I just explained, it depends on which Asians you're talking about. And Abe, Mr. Abe was, as I say, he was smart enough uh, to I say, not talk too loudly about those, the, those issues. Because he saw his bigger, Japan's bigger need was not to redo history um, and, and to sort of settle scores, but rather to uh, protect itself uh, for the present time and also protect an idea, which is this free and open Indo-Pacific, which is really you could change Pacific for world, I think, and the same ideas would apply. And so, but to have a Japanese prime minister speak in this way, this articulately, um, I can't think of one uh, who did. And I've, I've, I counted the number of prime ministers who Japan has had since I got there, and it's about 20. Um, and before that, there was Prime Minister Nakasone, who was a statesman as well. So that's been, among those 20, I think you might have one who is a candidate, but the other one is Abe, and he is the, definitely was a statesman. One phrase he used that really caught my attention early on, not recently, but he said that the Chinese growth in its military power threatened to turn the South China Sea into Beijing's lake. Now, I would expect that his perception of that threat would be shared by those other nations, including Vietnam, Thailand, even Indonesia, Singapore, and the Philippines, which see their interests, their economic interests, and not to say their military interests, would be deeply affected if, if China succeeds in doing that, and it's pushing to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. Um, and this, the Prime Minister Abe and other Japanese, you know, he wasn't the only one thinking this. And I would note particularly the Japanese military. It's been saying for years, um, for example, Taiwan's defense is Japan's defense. And Mr. Abe has late, recently was saying that, but I've heard it for many years from the military. And it is true that the, the Chinese have their eyes on the South China Sea, but unfortunately they've kept their eyes on the South China Sea. And I would suggest that maybe by about 2015 or so, they had effectively de facto control of it. Um, they just haven't gone about enforcing that control to the point where they say, well, Japanese ships, if you want to come through, you're going to have to get permission, etc. Uh, other countries' ships, same thing. They haven't tried to enforce it. But they have, they've actually passed domestic laws that, where they say that it, this is Jap Chinese territory. You know, we will, we require everybody, we have administrative control over ships coming in. Uh, they say they haven't enforced it, but one day they will. Uh, but th so they've, have, they've, I don't want to say locked up the South China Sea, but there's definitely, that word de facto control is not too far off. And something like 80% of Japan's for, uh, oil comes through the South China Sea, huge amount of its trade, and it's even higher for South Korea. Um, as you said, the Vietnamese, they have uh, similar interests, particularly on the fishing uh, end, and there's no love lost between the Vietnamese and the Chinese in general. Um, but And the Filipinos as well, they've lost some of their territory. The Chinese have just taken it. And in 2012, the Chinese took uh, an area called Scarborough Shoals, which is just to the west of the Philippines. It's only like 100, 120 miles from the coast, so it's well within the economic, exclusive economic zone. It's, it's, China, it's Philippine territory, and the nearest Chinese turf is at least 800 miles away. But the Chinese came down and took it, and the, Ameri the Ch Filipinos were expecting the Americans to help them out. The American State Department and administration at the time thought up all sorts of reasons as to why they didn't have to, despite there being a treaty. And this was a devastating blow to the U.S. reputation in Asia. Um, but that's talking about the South China Sea. And the threat is understood, and not just in the South China Sea, but in the rest of Asia, um, that the, the Chinese are looked at askance. Um, but there's also a sense that, well, you know, we need them, kind of need them for business. We, uh, they, we do business with them and we sell them a lot of stuff in particular. Um, but also you are leery about getting 
a country that big mad at you, and particularly when their military uh, has beefed itself up in the last 20 years in what I think is fairly called the uh, biggest, fastest military buildup in history, and to the point where they are a, a formidable force. Uh, they have their shortcomings, um, just like everyone else. Uh, but they, in certain circumstances, they would give us a run for our money. And I would, as a, just one sort of it's a telling sort of uh, example, is if you notice the Americans send an aircraft carrier into the South China Sea and they exercise and they send a destroyer through the Taiwan Straits, if the Chinese wanted, they could uh, deploy at least 10 ships for every one we can put in. Uh, so, and if they, at one point, I think you're going to see the Chi Chinese effectively escorting us and publicizing it. Well, we let them come through and we escorted them through. But it is, and that is the outmatch, the, the overmatch. Uh, and the numbers do matter. And 10 to 1 is probably being optimistic uh, if you are conservative. If you say, for example, if you use the, well, one, they're building seven ships for every one we are these days. Uh, and the math adds up. They've got, uh, what, 350 ships and are heading upwards. We have 298 to cover the entire world. Um, and it's going downwards. That's right, to about 280 is where it's headed. Uh, and they claim they're going to build more. But also the Chinese have a fishing fleet and something called the maritime militia, which are like fishing boats built to fight, to hurt. And, you know, you put a anti-ship missile on a maritime militia boat, and it looks like a fishing boat, and yet you know, if they decide to pull the trigger, you're going to have a, you don't want to be an American destroyer skipper uh, who's, you know, he's got 20 fishing boats around him. And then suddenly he finds himself with six anti-ship missiles coming in, supersonic speed. And he's got about 12 seconds to figure out what to do. Uh, and that, so that it's, I don't think I'm overstating how uh, potentially dire the situation is. But of course, there's more to it than that, is if China did decide to play rough in the South China Sea, then they would run the risk of really punishing financial and economic sanctions. And we still have uh, the ability to cause them no end of harm for now. Yeah. Well, another part of Abe's thought when he announced that Japan is back was Japan's ability to defend itself, or at least to increase its ability to defend itself, which was, you, you would be able to speak very authoritatively to this question, which wasn't too impressive 20 years ago or so. To what extent did he succeed? I mean, he, he did increase defense budgets. He established a national security council, passed a secrecy law, but he, he wasn't able to revoke Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, which the United States imposed after defeating it in World War II, which makes it a pacifist country. So how would you uh, judge his achievements in that area? I think after I'm done talking, you'll probably see why I don't get invited many places by the uh, Japanese government or the U.S. government. You're always welcome here. I know, so that's <laughs> <laughs> But he, he did a good job up to a point. And what I, I'm getting at is one of the big things, that, the big changes, is that he helped Japan shift itself psychologically to the point it realized that it did face risks and just might have to fight a war uh, to protect itself, and that it needed to do more to assist the Americans. Because for a long time, the Japanese, uh, literally, they, they said, well, you Americans have to defend us, but we don't have to, we're not going to do anything to help you. We're not allowed to because of the Constitution. And I was talking once to a Japanese diplomat, and this would have been 2005 or six. Um, it was before Abe came, even the first time, as I recall. And I told him, you know, look, if, if you guys think that you can whistle up the Americans like you would a taxi outside the Mayflower Hotel uh, to come die for you. That is not going to be a vote getter in Washington. And you may not want to be too sure of that if you guys don't do more. And he looked at me and he said, well, no, that couldn't be because, and he said, Ampo Joyaku. He it almost stuck his tongue out at me. And what Ampo Joyaku means is defense treaty. He said, well, we have a treaty. Like they have a contract that obligates Americans to come die on Japan's behalf. 
uh, and it's like it, you know I like the Japanese as much as anyone and done more for them than most people but that resonated with me in the wrong way but what Mr. Abe did was to get that thinking shifted and that was no small feat and he got it done with I'd say the population at large because he often spoke directly to the population and the Japanese read newspapers they have a pretty good sense of foreign affairs and I'd say better than most people uh, probably better than most Japanese politicians but he also got the Japan Japanese pol the political class to go along with this and the, there's always been a conservative element in or a sort of pro or a, an element in the Japanese political class that wants a strong defense uh, but then there's been others who don't give the matter much thought and then there's a, s a smaller group that is opposed to it it's this others who don't give the matter much thought that he was able to marshal them and he also did some things that were legally very important and one is he got the um, a formal sort of reinterpretation of something that is called collective self-defense and that is the idea that uh, that Japan uh, would not um, get involved with any sort of sort of mutual assistance, uh, mutual defense assistance or collective self-defense with another country, except or maybe the Americans. And he got that, the ex interpretation of that expanded to the point where the Japanese military can do almost anything it wants uh, if the government tells it to, um, to be of use to other countries. And along these lines, he got the, what they call the U.S.-Japan defense guidelines changed. And some very good work was done at the lower levels, by at the, the working levels on both sides. And now the, the, there's no legal objection really to Japan providing all necessary support to the, uh, to the, the Americans. Um, and Japan has also gone about, they've established, um, there's, there's agreements that allow for support to be provided in both directions with the Australians. Uh, and some other countries as well. I just can't think of them as right now. But these, and even the British, I think they signed one recently. And the point is, this was unthinkable, maybe five years ago. But I think Mr. Abe deserves uh, the, the, all the credit for that. And he faced a lot of opposition to everything he wanted to do. And that's important to remember because he didn't, he didn't just snap his fingers and get what he wanted. He really had to do the, the political work necessary, the, particularly the persuasion uh, to to get these changes done, so you had a psychological change, legal changes, and but where I, I would say he came short was, and you know, it's you know it's how it is. It was really in improving Japan's defense capabilities, um, and I mean in actual concrete terms, and the ability of U.S. forces and Japanese forces to really operate together well. Um, they there's still a lot of work to be done in that regard and I would give you just a couple examples is <clears throat> the Japanese self-defense force uh, they can barely do joint operations which means they have a, an army a navy and an air force but they can barely do a coordinated operation amongst themselves that's right and it'd be like your fingers each doing what it wanted to or just saying well hand go take care of it and but there was nothing controlling each finger um, they don't really ha they don't have a joint sort of uh, sort of command system, and they don't get out and practice the stuff. So they're not even the sum of their parts. Unfortunately, um, there's one exception to this, and that's the Japanese Navy, which is it, it's a, it has a very good niche capabilities in submarine warfare, surface warfare, anti-submarine warfare, surveillance. They're excellent, and um, they. Or pretty, you can almost regard them as an adjunct of the U.S. Seventh Fleet, um, th and that's how good the relationship is. And it shows what is what Japan is capable of, and it shows what they're capable of doing with us. But the, the as far as the U, the U.S. Japan relationship goes, uh, the military relationship goes, um, the 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 thing that I the, I would point out is okay. Where is your where is your um, joint bilateral headquarters? In Japan, where is that room where you have screens and you have Japanese and American soldiers and sailors and airmen together coordinating in the defense of Japan, carrying out training and exercises to uh, defend the country? Um, you know, where is it? It doesn't exist. And this is after almost 60 years of alliance. And this is really, it, it's the, the truth teller. 
Um, so if the Americans and the Japanese are going to get work together to defend the country, say something happens with Taiwan or South, someplace you need to respond, well, the plan seems to be to wing it. Uh, and that's not really how you want to do it. The navies are the exception, um, but the Japanese Navy is probably half the size it needs to be uh, for all the missions that it has. Uh, and that's obviously a problem, but M M Mr. Abe, he gets credit for, um, I'd say, arresting a, a decade of declines in defend Japan's defense spending. Because for the 10 years before he came along, um, or roughly, the every year the Japanese had cut their defense budget. The Americans said, please don't, but they did it anyway, because they weren't afraid of anybody. Um, and then uh, Mr. Abe came in and he stopped that. And he, every year he got increment, these small increases, not big enough. But what he was doing was bringing Japan out of a trough. So it isn't as if, I think Japan's defense spending during those years, his second term, it increased something like in total 15%, whereas the Chinese increases a lot more than that every single year. Uh, so he did, that's where he, you know, and say in terms of actual capabilities, there's so much more work to be done that whenever I hear somebody say, you know, that, oh, this is the, you know, Jap the Japanese military's, you know, is this or that, or, you know, it's all set, can take care of itself. Uh, it, it can't yet, you know, but to say parts of it are good, uh, the Navy in particular, and their new Marine Corps, of course, but it's not big enough. But, the, um, but you see the potential there because the quality is, is the potential is, is really good if we could get it. But Mr. Abe, as I say, he didn't have quite the success um, that he, he would, I think he would like to have had. Um, the, you'd mentioned about the Constitution, this Article 9, which is the, uh, the provision which pretty much says that Japan will not ever use force to solve disputes. Uh, and it's, it's like the, the cornerstone of the so-called pacifist constitution. Uh, if you read the plain language of this, the Japanese would barely be allowed to have a police force um, or almost not even be allowed to have knives and forks. Uh, that's how clear the wording is, and it's understandable. If you think of 1946 and all everything that had come before that, you just didn't want to have that happen again. Um, but it's been reinterpreted out of its plain meaning almost since the day it was written. Um, the, as soon as the Korean War broke out, the Americans said, well, you know, maybe we overdid it a little bit. And as I say, it's been reinterpreted um, it constantly so that Japan has been able to do whatever it needs to do to defend itself when it feels like it has to. Um, but they do use it the way you would a monopoly get out of jail free card. Sometime when they don't want to do something, they will say, mm -hmm, Article 9. And the Americans will, it works like kryptonite on the Americans, but you know, we should um, call them on that more than we do. Well, as part of uh, Abe's legacy, there was an election in Japan on July 10th, uh, and his Liberal Democratic Party triumphed. Uh, the new Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, has said he wants to increase defense spending. That's part of the legacy he embraces. And he also is very frank about the dangers from China. In fact, he said Ukraine today, maybe East Asia tomorrow. Because of the super majorities that the Liberal Democratic Party and its ally now have in both houses, is it more likely that Kushida will push for a formal revocation of Article 9? I think he will. It won't be a revocation. They'll just um, rewrite. Amendment. Well, th that's right. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it will rewrite it. And it, it's also important to remember that when we talk about if say even if they did revoke it, that Japan today is a has, there hasn't been a better behaved country in the last 65 years. Uh, it is the higher manifestation of just human decency and freedom, and that so I say that needs to be kept in mind because often you'll hear particularly from the Chinese propagandists. Uh, that well, this J Japan is rearming, remilitarizing. That it's going to become the Japan of the 30s. And that, that's nonsense. Uh, it's just absolute nonsense. But it goes unchecked. So I'm just pointing that out. Um, but what they would do is re. Uh, there's the main thing would be they would re rewrite it to formally recognize the Japan Self Defense Forces as lawful. 
as a sort of a legal organization because it's it's vague right now and uh, what and without that think of the morale effect that would have suppose the US military everyone in it you know they were kind of considered you know not quite legal that you know that you, know, you don't really belong here but we'll tolerate you or and in fact they're they're treated like um, civil servants so you they would the guy who issues the dog license at the ward office in Minato-ku in Tokyo he has about the same status as a, a member of the military and they're very different activities where the the downside risk from being in the military is pretty darn high not so much the guy who issues the dog license uh, and that's one of the things that they want to do is to give this morale boost to the military and the Japanese military and, and that I think is, is well, way overdue because these people really are uh, Japanese patriots. I mean, you, 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 most people never meet a Jiekan, which is what you would call a member of the, uh, the military. And most Japanese don't even meet them. And they, if you saw the terms of service, the salaries, the living conditions, um, the lack of a GI Bill, um, and yet these people serve. You'd be amazed, and you know, it's once again an example of the uh, how they do it. Is you know the, in the housing that the families live in is generally decrepit, um, and in the summertime, many families will not turn on their air conditioners because they can't afford it, and it's as hot as Japan, Japan as it is here. Uh, but they do serve. I mean, these people they don't do it for money or for you know the things that a lot of us would join for, or the, the added part. Um, and that's what part of this change of the Constitution is intended to do, is to give a morale boost to the military, and also just take away this lingering suspicion that somehow there's, there's something tainted about Japan's defense, uh, and, and the Japan self-defense force. So that, that's what, and I think Kishida is, uh, is going to go, I think he's going to try. Um, he has the, the legislative clout to do it now. Uh, and what it requires is, uh, let's see, a ma two-thirds majority in each house, each house of their Who parliament. Which he has. Mm -hmm. With, and I think, the, I think he's got it. And he's, it's cause he just, I think he has it. Um, and then you have to have a national referendum. You have right. to win by one, or one vote, or 50 plus one. And I think he's going to try. Uh, I th and if, I, think, see, I think a lot of the, the benefit of that would be psychological. Uh, as much as anything else, and political in some respects. Um, but the you'll notice also, and it's worth mentioning because it tends to get lost in the uh, sort of the reportage, is that when Mr. Kish uh, Prime Minister Kishida says he's going to double defense spending in roughly five years, is the um, and he said something like, I'm going to substantially increase defense capabilities. He used another word, but it was substantially increase. And he doesn't say what exactly he's going to do. Like, what's he going to spend the money on? Uh, he, they, that has not been clear. Um, is it just going to be on new fancy hardware? Is it going to be personnel, you know, the salaries, etc.? cetera? Um, is it going to be to allow better training? Is, it, is he going to um, use it to uh, improve Japanese capabilities, say, for joint operations? Um, how about building some war stocks? Because they don't have them, or they don't have what they need. Um, and then improving the capabilities. You know, what exactly will that mean? And that hasn't been um, laid out in a anything near clear terms uh, at all. And part of the reason here, I think one of the problems is that the Japan, we, it's a bit like trying to build a house. You know, say you have a lot of money, you want to build a house. What do you do? You know, well, I think I need a permit, you know, or I think I need to get an electrician. Okay, where are you going to, you know, how do you do that? You know, how do you, the, the expertise, the sequence of know-how and ac actions that you need to build a house, it requires some specialized expertise and experience. The Japanese don't have it. One of my questions was going to be regarding military hardware, whether they have the industrial capacity to build the things they need. I mean, you, you mentioned the growing size of the Chinese Navy, and they have a huge number of shipyards. The United States is down to two. How many does Japan have? If, if you say their navy is half the size it should be, have they maintained the industrial capacity to rearm? Not really. Uh, I don't think they have it. Um, they could have it 
but the you find that a lot of Jap Japanese companies uh, that they see defense uh, sort of business as a, an interesting niche, but not the main thing. It's a 10% of your business, which it's nice, but it isn't anything that's prioritized. And it, you, to do that, you have to have some reason to do it, and the government hasn't, you know, given that to them. Um, you know, they could have it, but they don't have uh, what they need, um, and that's, um, you know, ov obviously a problem. That you know, we don't have it either, of course, but you know, they, but the Japanese don't don't either. But in terms of knowing what you need to do, say to just you know to get the right hardware, the right capabilities. To spend the the money the the right way, that what the, I think they need is that they need some expert somebody to tell them, you know, just as if I wanted to build a house, I would find a general contractor and say, what do I need to know? I might even, in this case, you can't leave it up to you know you couldn't if you're Japan you can't say okay take care of it for me. But what do we do? And that's where I wish the Americans would help them. Uh, and you would rec it isn't policy people that you need. Uh, to do this, because you know, policy is easy, but the nuts and bolts of what do you need to put together an effective military? And in Japan's case, it would be taking a, a really good base and then making it into what it needs to be able to fight in its own right against the existing threats and to fight alongside the Americans in a really integrated way and with other countries. And that's where I wish we would get some, I would say, some of our uh, planners, American planners. You know, some good ones, some quietly link them up with the Japanese and say, look, here's, here's what you guys ought to need to do. And you'll find that when the Japanese know what they, when you know what they need to do and they feel a sense of crisis, they'll often, they'll come through uh, pretty well. But the Americans have held back on that. It's as if we don't want to be the overbearing American. And it's, but the Japanese will not figure it out on their own. So they don't feel a sense of crisis. Oh, they do, but they don't quite know what to do about it. Mm. Yeah. Well, one thing Abe did was it was one of the r real moving forces behind the Quad. Mm -hmm. So India, Japan, Australia, the United States, as a counterweight to to growing Chinese power. But you know, is it my sarcastic comment about NATO? Until recently, is there was a inverse proportion between its ex expansion and its own disarmament. Mm -hmm. Most of the nations of, in Europe took it as occasion to simply decimate their own militaries because either there's no threat or the Americans will protect us. Did Japan turn to the Quad in a way that we, we need these other nations to help do what we ourselves are incapable of at the time? And do each of them think that, uh, India and Australia, or is there a sufficient sense of crisis that they all think, no, we have to increase our capabilities so that we're a credible deterrent. I think it com sometimes compared to NATO, the Quad, as short-lived as it is, or, um, actually looks pretty good. The, and I would say when I complain about the, I'm not complaining, I'm just pointing out the realities of Japan's defense. Uh, but compared to some big NATO countries, the Japanese look awfully good. Um, but the, I think the Quad does, in, you go down the list and we're probably the ones that have the least sense of crisis. Uh, the Australians clearly to understand uh, the threat they've got from China. The Indians will tell you they've been at war with China since 1962. And they had a, uh, they had a fight up on the border a year and a half ago uh, where lives were lost. Uh, and it's, it's ongoing. So there's, they, there's, there are no doubt about the problem they have with China. Uh, they actually kind of make fun of us sometimes and say, well, don't you Americans understand? You know what you've got going with them, and the Japanese—they uh, really do understand. You know, you you look at, but translating that into the concrete uh, steps necessary to really build Japan's defense—that's the uh, where a lot of attention needs paid. And once again, I think it's if we would just help the Japanese understand the specific things they need to do. But you know, interestingly, when you when they take surveys of the Japanese public and they ask something like, do you see China as a problem? The response is like 90% yes. Uh, if you took the same survey on Jap in Japan's parliament or diet, they would pro probably like 60%, and that's up from 40%. Uh, it'd be a little higher, maybe, but that shows the success, the success of Jap Chinese political warfare 
over decades, really subverting Japan's elite class. But so the, it's a really long way of saying, yes, I think the Quad, you know, these are some, the, each country there, it does have its the, it sort of minds focused in the right direction. And that's, and once again, Mr. Abe started this and he started the basic idea in his first term, 2005, 2006, and he was laughed at, if you remember, um, by the, the commentariat and the, the China hands all laughed at him. But he was right. And then he got his second chance and he brought this thing about. And he's had some good people around him, of course. But it, at the same time, if he had failed in all of this, they'd be, he'd be taking all the blame. And I think he deserves much of the credit. Uh, and it's, what's really unfortunate, amongst other things, is that he was recently, um, before he was uh, murdered, uh, was really, out, not outspoken, but he was speaking out loudly about what Japan needs to do what it needs to do for Taiwan. He was talking about the threat and he was an influential politician, I think the most influential one in all of Japan. Uh, and it's, it really is unfortunate that he's gone. But, uh, well, one thing about which Abe spoke forthrightly and recently, this was just this last April, he said the following about the United States, the policy of ambiguity, that is regarding Taiwan, worked extremely well as long as the U.S. was strong enough to maintain it. And as long as China was in far inferior to the U.S. in military power. But those days are over. And he finished by saying the policy of strategic ambiguity, and this again is a quote, is now fostering instability in the Indo-Pacific region by encouraging China to underestimate American resolve while making the government in Taipei unnecessarily anxious, unquote. There must be no longer any room for doubt in our resolve concerning Taiwan. That's pretty strong statement. It appeared as if fairly recently President Biden dismissed that ambiguity until the White House cleanup crew said, well, that's not exactly, he didn't mean that. That's we're sticking with our traditional point of view. On top of which, by the way, late last year, the defense minister of Taiwan said their military situation and capabilities was the worst he had seen in 40 years. Yeah, that's um, what Mr. Abe said. I've never heard a Japanese politician say that. Or prime minister. It was, in fact, you barely hear any other uh, prime ministers or presidents speak that clearly on on the issue. And before Japanese, this was, was unheard of. And yet, uh, you know, from my perspective, I couldn't, wouldn't challenge him on a word. So you agree with the substance of that remark? I do. In fact, when I first heard it, though, you know, I, my initial reaction, because I'm by nature resentful, I suppose, is, well, he's telling the Americans what they right. have to do. But is he telling the Japanese what they have to do? And the answer to that is yes, he was. Or, and I, once I looked into it a little, once I got over my initial resentment, but you look at what he was also telling the Japanese. He was saying, you, we have to do more. And he was saying, we will be the laughing stock if we don't. And that is the kind of direct talk that, that has an effect. Uh, and it's, it's um, you know, it was just so unique for a Japanese prime minister to say that. But as part of the, so they say, that's the second half of what he was saying is that um, not just the Americans need to uh, take, these, take this really seriously and do some things, but the, the Japanese do too. And that's where there was really was some momentum that was built. And I think it's going to continue uh, despite uh, Mr. Abe's departure. Uh, in terms of the characterization of Taiwan and its situation, I think that's probably not far off. Um, the, you, know, you hear so much about um, and how much America supports Taiwan. You know, we're rock solid support and this and that. You hear politicians and presidents say this. But what I would say, and the Taiwanese, they're too polite to say it, but they all think it, is okay, if you really support us, why won't you be seen in public with us? And what I'm specifically referring to is the American forces doing joint operations, joint training with the 
the Taiwanese for Taiwan's forces. We don't do it. So the Taiwan military has effectively undergone 40 years of isolation. So it's a little bit like a Galapagos military, that it, it has not developed in the way it should, uh, just professionally, capability-wise, hardware-wise, because we've isolated it. And why have we isolated it? Well, as we're afraid of the Chinese Communist Party, is the, ultimately that's the, the reason. I think maybe for the first 10, 15 years, the idea was that, well, if we give the Taiwanese too much, they might attack China, you know, which has never been. You know, imagine that. Um, but now that that excuse is long, long gone, but you still hear it. And that's why they, uh, some of the web, they won't sell certain weapons to Taiwan. Um, and it's but really provocative. That's the idea. It's it, but and provocative to the Chinese, but I would suggest everything is provocative to the Chinese communists. And not being glib, but you know, I think Taiwan could surrender tomorrow and the Chinese would probably complain. Um, but the provocative part is actually, the idea was that it would uh, encourage the Taiwanese to lash out at you know, this Chinese behemoth, which they have no intention of doing. Um, it would be nice to have the capability to reach into China and sting them if the, uh, the attack comes. Um, but the, it is that 40 years of isolation that we still will not break. That is, it's not, it's not only hurt Taiwan's defense capabilities, but think of the psychological effect on Taiwan's military. Well, no, we don't. We think, you know, we face this enemy that wants to, says it's going to destroy us and enslave us. And we sure need some friends, but the biggest friend, you know, he doesn't really want to be seen in public with us. And he doesn't like us enough to actually, uh, like, train with us, exercise with us. When we go to America to visit, when they do allow us, we have to wear civilian clothes. Uh, we used to have to, our officials used to have to meet in the nearby Starbucks at the State Department because they wouldn't let us in. Uh, well, what, is, what sort of message does that tell you? And you, if you go to Taiwan and sort of hang around a bit, you kind of get a sense of being, that people are being worn down. And the sense that you don't have friends, uh, it does, it, it, it'll, kill you. Uh, it, this idea that somehow that people like the Israelis are gamely sting, you know, ready to fight off any invader. Uh, now when you feel like you're isolated, that you, it, it does not have a good effect. And that's what, we're, what you see with Taiwan. And the idea of, as Mr. Abe said, strategic ambiguity, you know, in other words, w America ought to make it clear that it will defend Taiwan uh, and publicly announce it. Um, you know that I've heard it can be debated either way. If you asked me what I think, um, held a, held a gun to my head, I would um, I would say the uh, I would tell the Chinese Communist Party very clearly that if they do something to Taiwan, whatever they do to Taiwan, we'll do to them, uh, or that if they do, they will lose everything, and that's how serious we are. Tell them that quietly. You don't have to yell it in, you know, poke them in the nose and say. But make it clear that we are serious, and it does help if you're taken seriously when you make those statements, uh, unfortunately. And that's, that's part of the equation. Um, but also public statements are, would be useful. But once again, you, you word it the right way, but make it, say, make, the, the, make it so the Chinese communists have no doubt uh, what they will face. And when I say lose everything, you know, I mean, you look at um, in some ways they resemble an organized crime racket. And they've accumulated, each of them have accumulated, the leaders have accumulated a lot of wealth, much of it overseas, for example. Um, and they have their relatives overseas with green cards, you know. And um, I would make it clear that they're going to lose personally all of this, because I think they're quite willing to let the Chinese masses suffer to no end. But make it clear that this will, you guys will pay for this if you do, would be my take. Let's touch upon another issue for Japan, and that is China's claim of sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands. Does that resonate with the man in the street in Tokyo and with the parliamentarians? Is that a sensitive issue for them? It, it really does. Yeah. It's, um, in a, it's sort of point of reference is the, in Japan they have a newspaper called the Asahi Shimbun. And that's like their, Nor their New York Times, but even maybe a little more anti-military. Uh, and the Asahi Shimbun, from a few years ago at least, has been saying, we don't like what the Chinese are doing to the Senkakus. 
in that area. So it really does resonate. Um, you know, or it's, I don't know. If it's, you know, it'd be about the same as if, say, some country tried to take a square foot of Texas. Um, the Texans wouldn't like it, but it really does resonate. And you know, there's a tend for a long time the U.S. government really ignored, didn't, wasn't aware of the issue. They, it had been allowed to disappear. And around 2009-10, this is when the Chinese sort of started applying real pressure on the Senkaku Islands, and they had. By which you mean what? I mean, there's nothing on. Them, right? That's right. They're very small rocks of, or islands. I, I'd almost compare them to the Channel Islands off California, but not as big. Um, if you took some of the smaller ones with nothing much on them, that's about what you would have. But it's um, there's a, obviously there's it's a, when it's your territory. Uh, you know that square yard of Texas is just a square yard of something. But it, it's you know countries defend their territory they don't want to give up an inch of it but it's also is a, is a useful economically defense wise it's essential as you um, to defend Taiwan you have to have control of the Senkakus and you have to have control of your own southern islands and the Chinese have not have said not just the Senkakus but all of the Ryukyu chain it's that string of islands that goes from about Taiwan up to southern Kyushu which is the biggest southern island in Japan so it goes up there, oh, goodness, I don't know, 900 miles. And it's, it's a good long way. And the Chinese have said pretty quiet, though they've said in their own way, the whole thing's ours. You know, Senkaku's for now, but we'll get the rest of it uh, when the time's right. And the Japanese do understand that threat. They tried to ignore it until about a decade ago. Um, just pretend the Chinese wouldn't notice. In fact, you would go down there and you would see no Japanese military presence except maybe a surveillance plane now and then. And they've taken steps to get a military presence in the Southern Islands, but what they need to do... You mean on the ground or just naval? On the ground. They've put ground forces with uh, sort of surveillance equipment and anti-ship missiles and there's going to be anti-aircraft systems down there. And the Japanese Navy is more active down there, the Japanese Air Force too, but they're not really doing it in unison. It's as if each service has its own scheme, and they're not doing it with the Americans. But so you make this a real sort of a combined defense, U.S. and Japanese, of the Southern Islands, um, that that sends a political message in beyond the operational benefits that you get. And that needs done. It's easy to do. It just takes a little imagination and some will. And Mr. Rob said he didn't get that done, but, you know, things have someone who considered Japan's defense 15 years ago, looked at it today, would be very surprised at how, how much it has, it has advanced in terms of capability. It's not where it needs to go, uh, but it, it's better. And as I say, the psychological shift uh, has been immense to the point where the citizenry and the politicians, political class, they see their military's purpose as fighting, not putting on the snow festival in Hokkaido every year. With all the emphasis that Abe and Kishida gave to the issue of Taiwan, would you say it's their perception that the loss of Taiwan to the Chinese would make Japan indefensible? Yes. You know, so it, it's that key. It really is. You know, they, it, I don't know how you would, one would argue otherwise. Um, you know, I think theoretically you might be able to say, well, we could lose that and we'll just somehow defend to the south. You know, we'll, um, but that's not quite how it works. This would be the equivalent of having um, the walls of Constantinople breached. Um, you could still have some bastions on maybe each side or one side, but when the Turks are pouring in, they're going to come around you. And what you would find is the P Chinese People's Liberation Army, the the Navy in particular, would now be able to operate with ease to the east, and then it just swings up to the north a bit, and they've outflanked Japan's southern defenses. They're in a position to surround Japan, something that hasn't been the case since 1945, uh, and they swing south, and you've, uh, you can isolate Australia from the U.S., from the rest of Asia. You get out into the Central Pacific, and suddenly the Americans find themselves having, if they want to 
stay there. They've got to fight to their rear, or if they want to get back in, they have to fight through these Chinese, what, what is now a chi Chinese opposition, well beyond the so-called first island chain, that, you know, that chain from Japan to Taiwan to the Philippines down to Malaysia, uh, that you've suddenly, if you've been defending along that line like we have been, suddenly the enemy's in your rear. And that is, is the problem. A, you know, and also Jap the economic uh, problems for China or, and well, Japan in particular, if their sea lanes are cut, uh, that would just be an immense uh, problem for them. And it's, it's uh, those sorts of conflicts, though, they don't tend to stay confined. One could easily see this expanding into a global. The question is, to what extent do the other nations uh, in the area share that perception of the stakes in Taiwan? I think uh, a lot of Vietnam, uh, the Vietnamese do. You know, they, they think, uh, I think most of them understand it. Few of them will say it publicly. The Australians will. The but, Koreans? Uh, the Koreans, I get it as well. And once again, it depends on which Koreans you talk to, because there are some Koreans who are basically pro-Chinese and pro-North Korea, which is like the last administration that they had. But Koreans understand it as well, as much as Japan, because Japan at least has the prospect of you know, some sort of a corridor to the east that they could keep open and get things in and out. The Koreans would can easy to cut off. You know, they're just they would be surrounded, and the Koreans understand it. Plus, the nature of their economy is so much dependent on uh, exports, and and also fuel imports, uh, that they would be in huge. Pro they would have a, a huge problem and say they understand it, but once again, speaking out and saying this is uh, another thing. Uh, the Vietnamese, they of course understand it, and they, though they too, um, are unlikely to actually say it publicly because you know, Taiwan's gone, and then guess who turns on? You know, what's that's that's in hand. You know, Vietnam is an, an easier target. The Philippines, same problem, uh, but they their military is their defenses are so weak that they once again have to be careful about what they say, and you do have Chinese subversion has bought off a good chunk of the Philippine ruling class. Uh, so they, that's a problem as well. But the Australians have very, been very clear uh, that they see Taiwan about the same way that, that we do, the same way the Japanese do, uh, which is to their credit that they've um, said that. But if you get the Chinese operating their military into the Central Pacific, the South Pacific, um, Australia can be interested in helping out with Taiwan. But they may find that by the time they get any ships and aircraft up there, they've got a lot fewer than they started with. They'd almost have to fight their way you know, to get in there. And the Indians, of course, are big supporters of Taiwan. They understand they uh, have a very good sense of the geopolitics of this. Given all the problems you've addressed, Grant, how, how do you put the last part of the topic today was the future of the Indo-Pacific. Guarded optimism, guarded pessimism, or where would you? It depends on what time of day you asked me, <laughs> and probably well, what, what kind. Asian time or yeah, probably what kind of day I've had. I think weighs into it too. Um, you you have to be, um, if not optimistic, you have to be willing to fight it out. Um, and you know, I've meaning. Uh, well, what I mean is, you, I don't have time for people who say the game's over. And, and I'm from a Washington, an old Washington Senators fan, so I'm used to a game being over before the first pitch is thrown. Um, but the, uh, um, but no, I think that the, we've got a pretty good hand to play. When I say we, it's Americans and the free nations. Uh, and I would include Vietnam in that. Um, but they, we have a, a good hand to play if we keep our wits about us and we play it. Um, you put a comp American's military is still, it's not chopped liver. Uh, and it can still, at least for a few more years, it could cause the Chinese no end of trouble. Uh, they would lose everything they've got outside of China if they made a move, say, on Taiwan or against Japan. Uh, they'd lose, they can't protect it. And that is all subject to interdiction, seizure. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party leadership would lose all of their, say, their condos in Vancouver and New York City green cards would get revoked and they'd lose their bank accounts. And we're talking billions of dollars here. Um, the, the, plus you combine the, the military capabilities 
of say the Americans, the, the Koreans, uh, even the Filipinos in certain cases, you could use them uh, help usefully, uh, the Australians um, in, in particular, and then the Indians. And then you have some, you, if you show that you're willing to stand up and fight, you'll find others want in on it. So the Quad has some some very favorable potential. I think done right it does. Yeah. And once again, it's often if you show you're willing that you're not going to back down, then the bully's response is, well, maybe I didn't really mean it. Plus, if he's going to find most of his trade cut off, he's going to lose access to U.S. dollars, which uh, he absolutely must have, just as Jefferson Davis needed Yankee greenbacks, because the Chinese money is not freely convertible. So if you have these levers to play, and plus you, we have something as important, but it will not serve, I don't think it'll get you very far without the ability to, to knock somebody on the rear end, uh, is that we, we are free people. And what we, we're not you know, trying to defend a, a system like, I don't know, like 1930s Germany, where the, we have a, whatever, all the problems we've got, we have this people who are literally dying to get into the United States and the other free countries. Uh, and this is something that gives us a huge advantage, is that people want to, uh, you know, they want what we're defending. And I think they're more willing to join in with us, uh, but we do have to wise up quickly. Uh, I say, and, and I say, recognize the threat, get our own financial house in order, um, stop this, you know, it'd be nice if in the United States, one half of the political class didn't want to destroy the other and you can guess which one I'm talking about. That is unhelpful. Uh, reminds you perhaps of the, you know, you look at those, um, what happened to this last administration where the, the efforts were made to destroy it, to sabotage it. Reminds you of the, the Hungarian princes fighting amongst themselves whilst the Mongols were coming from the East. But at least you can say that there's a bipartisan agreement in, in the United States uh, regarding the growing threat from China. I think there is. And the value of our allies such as Australia, Japan, mm -hmm. and India. There is, but I would though we do have to, we got to deal with this problem of Wall Street um, funding the Chinese Communist Party, pumping in convertible currency. Well, that'll be for another program. That, that is, but we, so we have to deal with that, but we do have, they've got the military capability, the political strength, we have the alliances, and the Chinese hate alliances, which tells you something. If they don't like it, it's because it works. Um, and we have still have the global reach that, and the, the economic power, the financial wherewithal, uh, to really to shut down the Chinese Communist Party, to give them a choice you know, between if you want to do business with North Korea and Iran and Russia, go ahead, but not with the rest of us. And you know, so you have to keep, uh, keep your wits about you and um, then decide it's worth fighting for. And I think we do, we have an excellent hand to play. We just have to um, look at it and say, oh, we've got four aces, let's play them. That would be my sense. That's a great way to describe the quad, four aces. It's, it is four, and, it's, yeah. and that's, I hadn't thought of that, but I'm gonna, I'll tra I've trademarked it, and okay, <laughs> no, I've got it. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time today. I'd like to thank Grant Newsham from the Center for Security Policy uh, for joining us today to discuss the legacy of Shinzo Abe and the future of the Indo-Pacific. I encourage our audience to go to the Westminster Institute website to see our other offerings or to our YouTube page where there are a number of recent presentations on Ukraine, Russia, China, and other subjects. Thanks for joining us. I'm Robert Riley.